Net migration, our big story of the day in the UK this year, could reach one million people. That's more than 45,000 migrants arrived on small boats in 2022. Over 6,800 have crossed the channel this year. That's a tiny fraction of the total number of people who are settling in the UK each year. The figures are looking pretty startling. So joining me now is co-founder of Navara Media, Aaron Bastani, and GB News presenter, Patrick Christie. Thank you very much to you both for joining me this afternoon. Aaron, I'll start with you. What do you make of these figures? They are projections, but it looks highly likely that we're going to have net migration in the very high hundreds of thousands. Well, what do I make of them? Like you say, it's important to uh, state at the top that we won't know the actual figures for this until the end of the month. Um, and these are projections that have come out from a think tank, but they, they broadly seem correct if you look at the data underpinning them. Uh, the Telegraph did a good piece on this actually earlier on in the week. Most of the people of that 650,000 to 1 million figure, most of them are people coming here as students and their dependents. After that, you've got people who are coming here for work and their dependents. Uh, and then you have people here who are uh, migrating to the UK as a result of family issues. So maybe they've married a British national or it's the, you know, it's the, it's the daughter or the son of a, Brit of a new, newly naturalized British national. And then at the top, you really have, apart from Ukrainians, a very small slither of people coming over as refugees. It should be said, I was actually shocked at how few Afghans were included in that figure. You've got approximately 200,000 Ukrainians. That's really overwhelmingly where uh, asylum seekers, those uh, fleeing uh, political volatility and whatnot are are coming from it's from ukraine so it was shocking to me and i think for your viewers they will remember that famous line from david cameron in 2010 we will reduce immigration to the tens of thousands and yet we're at a million and i suppose the, the question i throw over to you and to patrick is you know the tories love to say well can you imagine what it would be if it was labor well the the kinds of net migration we're seeing this year and last year whether you agree with it disagree with it, whatever it's unprecedented and it's nothing like what we saw with labor from 1997 to 2010 I think that's absolutely right. Patrick, a lot of people voted yeah. to remove new Labour from government because they were unhappy with <laughs> the staggering levels of immigration. Then what do you see? Well, you see successive Conservative governments absolutely give up, it seems, on trying to bring those levels down and skyrocketing potentially to one million. It is a bit of a slap in the face to people who put their trust in, in the government yeah. to reduce those levels. No, it absolutely is. And Aaron on that is completely right. I mean, if the Conservatives, maybe one of the things that they had was, oh, we'll be tougher on immigration. Well, that's completely gone. And I think a lot of people are going to just roll over now and say, well, there is nothing. There's a Rizzler paper between the Labour Party and the Tories when it comes to immigration. And arguably, well, definitely, actually, the Tories' track record on it is even worse. And I think that is pretty shocking. More so than that, for me, it's the lies. OK, and it is the abject lies. We've been lied to about the desire to reduce net immigration to the tens of thousands. On top of that as well, we are, in my view, lied to about, about student visas. They say that only a small minority overstay their visa or legally choose to remain. That's the claim that makes it more palatable to people when figures like these predictions drop that say roughly around 500,000 students are predicted to arrive this year. But the Office for National Statistics says that there are no official figures that show how many students do not emigrate and remain in the UK. And indeed, every single year since 2012, when, as we all know, immigration, net migration was a lot lower, around 100,000 more student immigrants arrived than emigrated from the year before. So if you magnify that out, that is a huge number. We've spoken mm. a bit about their dependents as well. Sometimes they can bring as many as four dependents over. But for me, it is not just about these numbers that we're talking about here and, and the way it looks on a spreadsheet. I'm sure we're going to get stuck into the economic angle of it. But just quickly, I'd like to talk a little bit about something I would argue as being a bit more important, really, which is things like culture, way of life and rapid demographic change. And it is a human instinct to want to preserve where you live. People oppose HS2 or planning developments, for example, because they don't want their area to change. And so if it's socially acceptable to want to block a new housing development because you don't want your area to change, I think it has to be socially acceptable to say, I would really prefer it if my town didn't suddenly become minority British. And I think it's a, it's a problem, really. It's a problem that mm. not enough people think or that are, are vocal enough about that. Yes, Patrick, I, I think that's certainly true. Aaron, what do you say to that? Because a lot of people who have been concerned by immigration levels, you know, we talk about it in terms of economics, but actually deep down in people's hearts, they are concerned because the country that they grew up in perhaps doesn't look like how it used to. Is that a nasty, horrible thing to say or point out? 
Well, there's a few things I want to pick up. So firstly, on the economy, because of course that's the, that's the argument that's been made for for large scale immigration in, in mm. recent decades. It's it's great mm. for the economy. We, we we don't. I don't think we need to necessarily touch on that for the moment. I think when we're talking about the economy, what's striking with this data is we're looking at growth this year of about 0.3 percent, 0.4 percent. Let's be optimistic. Say 0.5 percent, 0.6 percent. But we've got a million mm. people coming in. What that means is that GDP per capita, that means GDP per person, is is absolutely going down. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a political incentive here for the parts of the government to actually have as many people coming in as possible to massage the GDP figures to say, well, look, Absolutely. we're not in a recession. It's very hard to well, be in a recession Trust when you have practically a million admitted people. That. Liz Truss practically admitted that was the case because, Aaron, you're, you're on, the, on the left economically. Uh, people, people, people continue to say, what did you say? Just a bit. Just a bit, just a bit. You're on the left. Um, People say, you know, it's essential to have immigration for economic growth. You've just countered that with the point that, yes, in terms of GDP, it looks like it, but not when it comes to per capita. Do you think that mass immigration has led to the stagnation of wages, has stopped our economy from becoming more productive in other ways, and that we're actually just taking advantage of people coming over from India, Pakistan, wherever it is, to work those menial jobs um, for us. It doesn't seem like a very sustainable way of running your economy, does it? So on the one hand, I think the fact we had large-scale immigration after 2004, particularly from Central and Eastern Europe, I think that's a big reason why we have low inflation in this country uh, after then. It's not the only reason, but you know, also I think China making loads of cheap stuff for the whole world is another reason. But we had low inflation for about 15 years until the last couple of years. And, and a big reason why was you know, immigration into the labor market, particularly for things like agricultural goods, food processing, building, et cetera, et cetera, construction. So that's one thing. It's helped keep inflation low. And of course, politicians say we like to keep inflation low. I think it really doesn't, it doesn't really matter. It's, let me give you a counter example here. So China, for instance, has around 1.1 million people, even now, going mm-hmm. from country to city every year. And that's a high growth economy. It's becoming a more innovative economy because of what that looks like. So you can see a world we have very large immigration in this country, mm-hmm. and it still leads to high GDP, high growth, rising productivity. Mm-hmm. It's, it's plausible in the realms of abstraction. I mean, look at somewhere like mm-hmm. Dubai or the UAE. You know, it's an economic powerhouse off, off the back of immigration. However, that isn't the model that we've had you have over the last 20, 25 mm-hmm. years. You have absolute massive inequality in places like Dubai, of course, places like Hong Kong. You have practically an an underclass doing all of the menial jobs, you might call them. Patrick, coming back to basically the Western world's reaction, Europe's reaction, Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've seen, but Germany are very much looking to abandon that open door policy that Angela Merkel brought in during the migration crisis. Um, when she essentially flung open the doors to people from Syria and from all over, all of the, all over the world, really, it turned out. Do you think that we're risking some, we're risking a backlash here with these, with these figures? Yeah. No, 100% we are risking a backlash here. Now, I want to preface what I'm about to say by saying that, look, in the round, clearly migration to Britain has been a good thing. And certainly you don't just, by the way, have to be white in order to be British. That's his stating the bleeding obvious, but I wanted to say that in case there are some kind of weird Twitter backlash. But the demographics to this, I was speaking to a, a demographic expert on my show uh, earlier in the week. He said that Britain by 2050 is predicted to be 50% white, it's roughly around 85% now, and 75% non-white in primary schools by 2050. Now, this indicates clearly a very rapid and very strong cultural change, and dare I say it, religious change as well. And the evidence of how integration hasn't necessarily always worked is plain to see in places like Bradford, Rusholm, Wakefield, etc. We all know the kind of areas around the UK. So rapid, high-speed yeah. population growth that involves different cultures and different religions, who are, by the way, very keen. And in some ways, I've got massive respect for them because I wish that, that British people were keen, as keen to cling on to their culture as some people coming from different parts of the world. But People who are very keen to cling on to their cultures, then therefore obviously can end up dominating areas. Yeah. And that can be a real risk. But, you know, it's not so much just about this, you know, racial differences or anything like that, or religious differences or cultural differences. I really do think it's the pace of it. It's the absolutely rapid pace of it. And when you look at those demographic predictions, it is reasonable to suggest that we have already reached the point yeah. of no return there. Yeah, um, Aaron, just very lastly, to that point, you, you, I don't think you, you answered that point earlier in the discussion. 
Do you think that it is a problem that we're seeing such rapid cultural change in this country? Well, I think what matters is do, do, do voters think it's a problem? You know, I mean, I, I can give my two bobs worth. But Aaron, does it worry you? Does it worry you? I mean, it depends where. For instance, I disagree with 300 people being dumped in a small village uh, who are claiming asylum. I think if if London has an extra 100,000 people who are brown or black, I don't think that makes the slightest difference. So, in terms of in terms of uh, migrants going to larger cities with high population density, already very mixed. I don't think. I frankly think very few people would notice. I, and I think this actually gets to the core of what happened with Brexit. Lots of people said, oh, well, the places with the least immigration are the most racist. They oppose Brexit. But you look at somewhere like Boston, for instance, the capital of Brexit. Yes, it had. It was still very white, but actually it's seen the most demographic change after 2004. Mm. So even though it was still very white, still seemingly very homogenous, it had changed a great deal. And I think what we're seeing now with this wave is a bit different. I mean, let's see. But because of the educational kind of element to it, these people are generally gravitating towards university towns, larger cities, places which, let's be honest, are more comfortable with demographic change and, and the pace of demographic change. So yeah. I'm not making any conclusions off the back of that, but I think that looks a little bit different to, say, Central Eastern Europeans going to Boston or Bognor or Skegness um, in the mid-2000s. Yeah. Well, what we do know is that this is going to be a massive headache for the government to try to explain these figures to the public who thought that they were trying to bring the numbers down anyway, perhaps naively. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Aaron Bastard co-founder of Navara Media and GB News presenter there, Patrick Christie's, talking us through those potential net migration figures that we're facing, up to one million.